Good afternoon, folks. How are you this afternoon? I'm Kevin Chavis, President of Academics, Policy, and Schools for K-12, and I have some good news and some really good news. The good news is you won't hear a lot from me. That's the good news. The really good news is you're going to hear from our chair, Executive Chairman and CEO, Nate Davis. And at K-12, we really understand what personalized learning is like. We've been doing it for 18 years. So there are a lot of lessons learned. And personalized learning is a buzzword now. Everyone talks about what personalized learning means. Well, I can guarantee you that after you hear from Nate with some of the videos and some of the information that we're about to share, you will have a better idea of what personalized learning really looks like, particularly with an eye toward what it will look like in the future. So without further ado, I'm going to present our chairman and our CEO, Nate Davis. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. Um, so, you know, to get us started today, I, I guess the most important thing to talk about is this community that we're going to build together, I think build together, to create what we call personalized education. You know, but one way to look at it is to look at what NAEP says. NAEP says that only 37%, 37% of the high school students in the United States are prepared for college level reading and college level math. 37%. But they look at countries like Finland and South Korea and they say, wow, you know, they're at the high, the high end of the list every year. So why are we at the low end of the high end of the list? America, one of the great things about America is we're very diverse. One of the tough things about America is we're very diverse. So let's take a look at a country like Finland um, and look at where they are in population, in size of their country, in the, the percentage of their people that are, are the same ethnicity. Look at um, how many languages are spoken, look at the poverty rate. Right? And you see the challenges that they're facing in order to produce a good education in their country. Let's look at South Korea. And South Korea has a little more population, a little less physical size, ethnicity is almost all the same, and we're looking at you know, not quite as many languages spoken. Um, they got some diversity challenges. Now let's take a look at the United States. Okay? And look at who we are. And then ask yourself the question, can we really have one model in education that's going to work for everybody? Is that really possible, given the, the diversity we have in our country? We have so many students, and this is unfortunate, who are in, in poverty level in our country. We have such a large, diverse organization. To tell me that education is going to work the same way in rural Mississippi, that it's going to work in downtown New York, is sort of a silly proposition, right? So we know that personalization is really important in this country if we're going to bring our educational system back up to where it is. So I want to talk to you a little bit about this company, K-12, and what we've done to try to take personalization and make it real. How do you put all the things together to do that? It starts with the data that's required for personalization. And you, know, you think about when you're an online student, every key click that you have, every time you interact with an assessment, Every time that you do any kind of piece of data, what you're doing is you're producing more and more data about yourself. And as that data about yourself begins to tell who you are and how you learn, the question is, what can we do about that? Well, how can we use that data? And that's the key for us. And we have about 450,000, 475,000 interactions every day with our students. Okay? We have about 750,000 outcomes that come out of that every day. And we've got to figure out how we use all that data. Well, we use it to produce analysis and produce reports and produce information that gives us great trends about what's happening and how students might learn. That's the key of producing this data. But producing all that for teachers and not just having them overwhelmed with charts is key to not only have the trends and the data available on a dashboard, but also to have that data in the dashboard available for the classroom level, which is the slide in front of you, which might say, here are the top 10 students and how fast they made it through the curriculum. Here are the students that are the bottom 10%. Here are the ones in the middle. How each student is comparing how fast they're progressing through their curriculum. And to take all that down to the student level, not just the classroom level, but to understand down at the individual student level, okay, how is that student performing? How are they learning? How fast are they progressing? And allowing ourselves to be able to, to take that data and give it to the teacher, not only the teacher, by the way, to give the parent and the student a great understanding of where they are in the process and what they can do to either accelerate the process or go on to the next step. 
It's a very key part. Another piece of data that's important for helping students personalize their experience is understanding who they are when they walk in the door. So we have this program called Strong Start. The program is all about making sure that we understand as much as we can about the student when they first enroll in the process. Through the enrollment process, all the way through the first day of school, we want to understand who they are, understand what we're dealing with. It's very important because if you understand anything about students, you understand you can't just deal with their intellect. You've got to deal with their social emotional learning. You've got to deal with what's going on in the home. You've got to deal with what's going on in their family life. If they've got emotional problems or they're just relocated or the dad or mom is going through some kind of trouble or they've got their own health problem, they're being bullied, all of the things that a child is dealing with, you don't deal with that. You're not going to give them the best education possible. So you've got to understand who they are, and you've got to be able to track that data on who they are. So once we do that in the early process, it gives us a chance to understand and refer them if they need additional help to what we call our FAST team, the Family Academic Support Team, which is made up of the teacher, a family academic support liaison, it's made up of the, the engagement coordinator, and they all work together to try to make sure every student is getting the full amount of attention they deserve. By the way, this doesn't mean everybody needs this. If you're a high achiever and your parents are actively involved and you're doing great, we leave you alone. Okay? But if you're struggling and you don't log onto the system and we can see that you're not engaged, we try to find out why and then find out what we can do to engage you better. Because that data is what's going to help us understand how to provide a program specific for you. They could be dealing with a teenage pregnancy. They could be dealing with abuse in the home. And while we're not social workers, we can't solve their problems. Understanding their problem is a key part of what we have to do. And I'm going to tell you something that you already know, everybody knows. And that is part of what we have to do is we have to provide socialization. Um, and everybody thinks, many, many people think, I shouldn't say everybody, many people think that in an online program, in a blended school program, you don't really get a chance to understand and interact with others, but we do. In this program, there are online clubs, there are school trips, leadership development forums, graduation parties, um, college and career workshops, all of these things that allow students to interact and not just interact with the student that is their neighbor in their neighborhood, which is what most students in a brick and mortar school get but a chance to interact across the state, and in fact, in some cases, across the United States and across the world. Very critical, very important for us. We once, um, by the way, I, I should say this, a couple of years ago I started a foundation because I believe that we should, in this industry, give back to, to our students in as many ways as we can. So we started a foundation called the Foundation for Blended and Online Learning. And uh, when I started that foundation, it was an attempt to get everybody who's in the industry to, to contribute and to help uh, foster scholarships, to foster environments where teachers can learn how to teach in this environment, and to foster um, conversations about the efficacy of it. Amy Valentine is in the room. She's the executive director of that, of that foundation. One of the th ways she gives out scholarships is she asks every student, please identify what you learned about working in an online environment, working in a, a blended environment. And I'd like you to see a video of just one young lady who's doing that. And today I will be telling you a little bit about what it was like to experience high school through what is called a blended learning program. My two friends, Expectation and Reality, will be helping me with this. So keep watching and I hope you enjoy. So basically, you didn't have any friends and you don't know how to socialize. Got it. <laughs> Actually, I dare to disagree. My blended learning program offered me amazing opportunities to meet people from all across the state, many of whom have been my best friends throughout all of high school. <laughs> well, of course you had to arrange these meetings yourself, right? No. Thanks to the funding my program received from the state, they were actually able to organize a lot of field trips on both sides of the state and set up learning experiences to other countries such as China, England, Canada, and they even set up a prom on the east and west sides of the state for the students. So you mentioned flexibility of schedule, um, but I'm assuming there weren't actually any school activities for you to participate in, um, since it was kind of an online program and you weren't able to you know, go across the country just to have a student government meeting for 30 minutes. 
On the contrary, technology has advanced so that we could actually meet virtually for things like student government or student publications, both of which I was a part of during my four years of high school. Um, the blended learning program also meant that we could meet on site with teachers and classmates who were from the area. And this gave us the opportunity to form clubs that would meet on a daily or weekly basis. Um, I actually was able to participate in a student-led Bible study, um, an acapella group, and even a mock trial team. I must admit, I came into this meeting quite skeptical about your school choice, but you have me convinced. I definitely feel prepared to take on the college world and I wouldn't trade this experience for any other. Amazing, Eliana is her name. She's um, a freshman in college right now. We have a job offer out to her in innovative marketing. <laughs> um, you know, another aspect of something that I think is a strange thing for a guy who heads an organization that's about online education to say, and that is online education is not for everybody. I'll repeat that, online education is not for everybody. But I think blended education is for everybody. Blending the best of the world from brick and mortar schools with what's available in online schools means you can, you can produce the best of both worlds. And I think blended is where the future of this country is gonna be in terms of education. Having more face-to-face -face interaction with students, it doesn't mean it has to be every day, but whether it's in the mornings and do online programs in the afternoon, or it's one day a week or two days a month, or if it's YMCAs and churches, or whether you do it in a, in a, in a physical building, a school building somewhere, we need to team together and bring more face-to-face -face instruction to these kinds of programs and make them blended programs. Another aspect, something you already know, I'm not gonna tell you many things you don't know today, but I'm gonna tell you how they pull together. And that is great teachers. My mother was a teacher. Um, I know the importance of teachers. And I gotta tell you that um, no matter what we do, no matter how much digital technology there is, great teachers are highly important. I want to have an environment, and we try to create an environment in K-12, um, program we call Teach 360, a 360 degree program for teachers. It's about giving them a chance to speak directly to me, and they do. Well, we have teacher ambassadors who talk directly to me, they talk directly to the senior management, they get involved in developing new curriculum, they get involved in industry forums to talk about how schools ought to be improved, they talk to the press, um, they do research projects and write their research projects. I had a chance one time to go to the Mayo Clinic, um, another chance to go to the Cleveland Clinic, and, and in both cases I was amazing how proud the doctors were um, because they were involved in all aspects of medicine research and development all the way to being practitioners. We ought to create that insane environment for teachers in every school environment we have to make it exciting for them, to make it productive and engaged for them because who can we hear can't remember a teacher who was an exciting person that didn't motivate us. So it's the same thing in an online environment. We also want to give them point certifications. We also want to give them master's degrees in how to teach in an, in an online environment. So we've created a program at Southern New Hampshire University uh, one of the premier schools at, at learning how to teach in an online environment at the post-secondary level, and use their program to develop a master's program for our teachers as well. Um, engagement. Engagement matters. This is another thing that's obvious, right? How do you engage students? The more engaged they are, the more they learn. We found that students who don't engage, if we can't get them engaged, we actually hurt their education in the first three months they're there, meaning, if they come to a program like ours or any program, switching out of a brick and mortar school, and then they leave again within a couple of months, they're actually hurt. Because during that period there, they lost time. But if they stay in the program and they stay engaged, we find that at the end of three years, three years compared to less than a year, their grades and their proficiency scores improve by 17 points in reading and 11 points in math, okay, against if they had not been in one of these schools. So we know the efficacy works, we know the process works, but we have to keep them engaged. One of the ways we keep them engaged is a new program we're starting. Um, my family always uh, uh, creeps into things that I say and I talk about, so right now my daughter is, is in my mind. She is um, the love of my life, um, and her brothers are jealous about that, and I tell them to get over it. <laughs> but she went to college and she took a uh, program a program and a degree which I won't mention, which today she's five years out of school and she still is not working in the field that she was educated in. And we have way too many kids who go to school 
and learn and work in a curriculum that can't get them a job. And it's because many times they don't really understand what they want to do when they go to college. We started off with this career technical program trying to make sure that they just had a few options to understand what's technology and IT like versus nursing versus heavy machinery operation, giving them some exposure to that so they would make better decisions when they went to college. It turned out that they went for certifications, many of them went to two-year schools, and it actually turned out that they stayed in school longer. So graduation rates began to increase, retention began to increase, so we made it a bigger program. And now we have 1,800 students in our Destinations Academies. We have seven of these schools nationally. Next year, we'll have 15 of them. And the Destinations Career Academies are going to have 19 um, uh, career readiness categories, uh, what we call career pathways. And those pathways are going to allow students to understand not just what career paths are out there, but take summer jobs and internships, have corporations come in and give presentations to the students, have them do field trips in, co in companies and organizations, have trade associations help us predict what kind of jobs are available. And that partnership with business and trade associations and universities allows our students to have a better understanding of what kind of jobs are available and make better choices in their life. Um, a very another key, key part of what we want to do. So I've talked to you about all the things that we've learned and forgive me for talking fast, but they tell me that if I don't get through this in 25 minutes, they're going to unplug the video, so, <laughs> so I'm moving. Um, all of the things that I just talked about are all things that you know are important. Everybody knows these things are important in education. The key is, in a digital environment, and you know most of our country is eventually going to have to go to a digital environment. In a digital environment, how do you put all that together? How do you have the best of both worlds between what we learn from brick and mortar schools and what we learn from online schools? And that's the key that we've learned to do, is to put that all together in a platform and a technology that allows students to interact with each other across the state, across the country, and I believe eventually across the world. So what's next for us? What's next is artificial intelligence, I think, has to enter the classroom in a much larger way. You know, anybody who's been interacting with a teacher would know, as, as my mom used to do, when she came home and she had all these grade books on, the, on her um, kitchen table, trying to figure out which student was doing how well and which student was doing poorly and what she was going to do about that student. All those interactions. Well, in our system, believe it or not, if you take all the assessments that we do every day in each course for the 120,000 students that are in our program across the country and all the interactions they have, 750 million different individual outcomes for students. We've got to find a way to have artificial intelligence tell us when to present certain solutions to each one of those students. And those solutions will use um, something that we, we, we have as uh, we are employing called black, uh, Blackboard, white, I'm sorry, Broadboard. And it has a capability of presenting a student a solution at any significant point in time. Imagine a student in California and another student in Ohio, and they're struggling with the same lesson plan. And they need to figure out in math how to do something like solving, uh, multiplying uh, uh, numbers with decimals together. But the best teacher at teaching that may be located in another area. So how do we get the best teacher from New York or Massachusetts to help with students that are in California, Texas, Mississippi or, or Ohio. Let me give you an example. Hi, I'm Mrs. Bundy, and today we are going to be talking about multiplying decimals. Multiplying decimals is different than any other operation we use with decimals. When we add or subtract decimals, we line our decimal points up, just like that. But when we're multiplying decimals, it doesn't tend to work out the same way. Multiplying decimals is just like multiplying whole numbers. The trick is knowing where to put the decimal point in your product. Let's have a look at one method we can use to figure that out. So Mrs. Bunny is a real teacher. That's really her name. <laughs> She's not an actress. Um, and this is the tool that we pull up, and thousands like this, that we pull up on an individual case basis to help students get through. You know, what we found is that videos are actually more effective sometimes than live teachers. Why would we say that? Think about it. If any of you have ever dealt with, like I have, with a, a youngster who's trying to get something done, they pull up YouTube and they watch the video. They don't read instructions anymore. Nobody reads instructions, right? They just pull up the videos. They would rather listen to a video than listen to a live person. So why not use that? Why not use that video? And that's what we're doing here. Gamification is another thing that we know. Every child 
at a young age is pulling out cell phones and knowing how to open the cell phone, five digit code, four digit code, they know how to do that and they know how to play a game. So let's not push them away from games. Let's find a way to use the gamification to help them learn because if that engages them and makes them stay in the program, then they do better. In our program, we found that we tried with 5,000 students, this gamification approach, and we found that in the K to two levels, 73% and then the K to three to six level, 75% of the students found this to be wonderfully exciting for them and more engaging for them. And even when you get to the higher levels where games are not quite as important or games are more intricate, we still found over 50% of the students said the gamification was something that would help them stay engaged. Kids today can't get enough of video games. We've brought video games together with adaptive practice to drive engagement and accelerate learning. K-12's game-based learning platform is now being incorporated throughout our curriculum. Students complete practice problems at their own individual learning levels, which continually adjust to meet the student where they are on their learning journey. If students struggle for the correct answer, they're given a choice of learning activities. Students then earn bonus coins by completing the activities and demonstrating mastery. As an element of surprise, they even unlock treasure chests to see how many coins they've earned, which then can be leveraged to buy more games. And as students master skills, they even earn coveted badges, which serve as a powerful goal-setting prompt and even promote healthy competition among peers. This is a game for younger children, but games are tailored to the age of the student for maximum engagement. As we move forward, gamification will be woven into entire systems of digital courses, making students want to succeed and ensuring a lifelong love of learning. One more thing that can be done with digital technology is collaboration across, the, not just I said before, the state, the United States, and the world. Imagine what the world would be like when students in China and students in the US collaborate together on solving a problem. It could be a math competition. Um, we just signed a deal with the uh, Beijing Royal School in China, and they've agreed to do exactly this, to have their students online with our students from various schools and to work together jointly on problems. As they get to know each other, know each other's language, imagine the world it will have as our students all get to know each other better. Right? Collaborative learning is another step. And immersion learning is another step for us. 21st century classrooms are technologically advanced places of immersive learning with augmented and virtual reality driving new levels of student engagement and enhance collaboration. With augmented reality, or AR, users hold up their phone or tablet to see virtual objects placed in the real world. The overlay of digital content onto reality using trigger images and locations is opening up a whole new world of learning opportunities. AR can be used in science classes to create 3D images of the human body or to bring the periodic table to life. Students' reading comprehension can be tested and enhanced through AR pop quizzes. Virtual reality, or VR, offers students the ability to step into places and experiences previously inaccessible. For example, they can tour Ellis Island or the beaches of Normandy, turning history into an active learning experience, or even visit an art museum without ever stepping onto a school bus. This technology isn't just cool, it's innovation with purpose. Being immersed in what they're learning motivates students to fully understand what they're learning, since it requires less cognitive effort to process the new information. Eventually, both AR and VR will converge, providing an even more powerful set of tools. Bottom line, both students and teachers will see much more of the world than in the past, right from the comforts of their online or blended classroom. So I'm about to get the hook. So, you know, I am from New Jersey. I learned to talk fast, but <laughs> I didn't talk fast just because of that. I talk fast because we only have a certain amount of time. But if I could leave you with one thought, it would be this. Where I grew up, there's a saying, and the saying is that it takes a village to raise a child. I'd like to borrow that and kind of change it a little bit and say it's going to take a village, a village of all of us to make personalized education work in this country. The village is made up of all of the different components. I was downstairs in the Innovation Center and I got to see the artificial intelligence groups. We can borrow from brick and mortar schools, from charter schools USA and other innovative uh, charter schools, from regulators and policymakers who can help all the way to 
innovative providers of, of uh, virtual reality and artificial intelligence. All of us together, including foundations like the Foundation for Blended Online Learning, together can put this in an integrated form and bring more digital, digital information to students. And as we do that, it becomes more personalized. And it's more relevant in this country than probably any other country, save maybe England, that has this much diversity. So with that, I leave you and say, let's do this together. Let's make purposefulization in America important and real. Thank you.